Bitcoin solves problems I do have and I bet you've encountered some of these problems too. This is Frater Ralph with Hermetic Temple Radio and today on the world of crypto I'm going to be talking a little bit about real world problems that I have experienced and I bet you've experienced some of these real world problems too but real world problems that have been solved by Bitcoin. Before I get into that, I'm going to play a little introductory music by Celtic Reggae Revolution called Positive. And we will be right back. Positive people. It's beauty, but life has got its pain, 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 pain. with the smooth and get into the groove. Nothing ever will show, so you ain't got nothing to lose. No positive, positive, that's the way I wanna live. Positive change. Happier, happier. Positive, positive, that's the way I wanna live. This is Frater Ralph, and today I'm going to hang out with a cup of coffee and talk a little bit about Bitcoin and real-world solutions to real-world problems. 
and in between segments, I'm going to be playing some music. That was uh, Positive by the Celtic Reggae Revolution, and that was our Irish reggae uh, portion of the show for today. Later on, we're going to be playing a little bit of jazz by Barbara Leone, uh, some rock and roll by Hunter and the Dirty Jacks, and uh, I guess you call it rock and roll. Uh, they've got a pretty unique sound, but uh, I got one song picked out by Mojo Radio. Pretty neat group. So, the question I'm going to be dealing with today is Bitcoin. Qu people have been questioning, okay, with the uh, the rise in Bitcoin price and the fall that we've seen in Bitcoin price. You know, some people have been going on various venues saying that, oh, Bitcoin is, is just a fad, don't get into it, don't mess around with it. And uh, a lot of people have been spreading some negative publicity with Bitcoin. And this is to be expected. I've noticed going through YouTube videos, every time that there is a rise and a fall in the price of Bitcoin, traditionally, over the last few years, People go on to YouTube and they start spreading negative propaganda about, oh, uh, Bitcoin is crashing, Bitcoin is over, goodbye Bitcoin, you know, those sorts of things. And yet, Bitcoin has weathered all of those problems since 2009. Bitcoin has been there, it has had its problems, it has recovered. And in all that time, nobody has been able to corrupt the blockchain mechanism that is the lifeblood of Bitcoin. The whole technology that makes this payment system possible has not been hacked. It has not been compromised. Various exchanges have been hacked, yes, but the blockchain itself remains uncorrupted and uh, working just the way its developers intended it to work when it was first developed just uh well, how many years ago has it been now about <laughs> i don't know it's too early for me to do math and unfortunately that's one problem that bitcoin cannot solve but there are there are other problems that bitcoin uh can solve and does solve but before I get into that, I'd like to address a misperception that makes its way around the internet on a fairly regular basis. And that is the misperception that Bitcoin is this dark, mysterious internet money that's used by criminals and people who don't want to be traced so that they can engage in nefarious and illegal activities and that is a misperception as far as I can see I mean yes there are like I don't know two percent or maybe five percent of the global population that uh, are members of the criminal element the majority of people who do business over the internet and who do business using Bitcoin are people that really have nothing to hide they're not into dark, nefarious activities. They're not doing anything illegal. They just want to make payments without any problems. And uh, the majority of Bitcoin users are upstanding citizens, uh, good people. Uh, some are big business people like uh, Bill Gates and Sir Richard Branson. And others are small-time business people, like yours truly, right here. And it's just a wide variety of people that have successfully used this payment system because it solves problems. Not because they're criminals, but because they've had problems with the traditional methods of making payments, and they've discovered Bitcoin, and Bitcoin solves those problems problems. When people talk about criminal activity and various currencies and let's also say commodities that make criminal activity possible, 
you know, one of the biggest uh, currencies that's used by criminals worldwide, and especially in the United States, is the good old U.S. dollar. I mean, if you got something to hide, you don't want to have to show ID, you want to uh, buy something and you want to buy it quickly, just have your wallet full of good old U.S. dollar, and yeah, you can make transactions uh, real easily. And it's been known for years that criminals have been using the U.S. dollar uh, to engage in criminal activity. <laughs> Think of Al Capone and... Uh, you know the the old days of uh, gin running, uh, running and uh, uh, just uh, uh, bootlegging, and the whole prohibition period, and then the mobster period, and just think all the way up to our current day gangster period. Uh, U.S. dollar has funded a lot of that stuff, and yet people don't go around saying it should be illegal to use the U.S. dollar. Uh, one thing, one joke that I always love to uh, to play or, or always love to hear when you're standing in line, you know, uh, in a grocery store and somebody ahead of you is trying to write a check and the cashier says, okay, I'll need to see some ID. And then the person will fumble through their purse or their pocketbook to pull out their ID. And then they'll show their ID to the cashier and the cashier will write that information down on the check. And then hand the ID back, and uh, you know, five minutes later, she runs the check through the machine, and and it's approved. And then finally, you know, after about ten minutes or so, the whole process is completed. And then the next person in line is paying in cash, and they look at the cashier and they smile and and they say, uh, "You still take cash here, don't you? Do I have to show ID before you'll take my cash?" <laughs> and that's a joke, but. There may come a, t a day when uh, that's no longer a joke, you know, because U.S. dollar and other forms of fiat currency have been, you know, convenient ways to uh, for criminals to engage in criminal activity. Now, does that mean that fiat currencies should be banned? Again, I don't think so. I think a person should be absolutely free to pay check, cash, credit card, Bitcoin, Dash, Ethereum, you know, whatever currencies they have on them in this growing global economy, I think that uh, people should have that right. People should have those freedoms. But uh, there are some that uh, have, uh, well, some that say that perhaps cash should be illegal. But, I mean, that's that, that attitude's been a long time coming. So Bitcoin's not the only currency that can be used for shady purposes. And one commodity that can be used for criminal activity, and this is a biggie, think of ISIL, the Islamic State. We've had a huge problem with ISIL over the last few years. And, you know, ISIL came into being during the George Bush administration and during the Obama administration, ISIL uh, managed to get their hands on, on U.S.-made weapons, and uh, they've been receiving all kinds of funding, all kinds of training. Most people don't ask where that funding and training comes from. I'm hoping that President-elect Trump knows, because, I mean, he's taken it, taken it on the chin a few times, saying that he knows how to take care of the problem of ISIL. And a lot of people criticize him for that. A lot of people criticize him for a lot of other things, too. And although I am not a Trump supporter, I, I agree that the problem with the Islamic State, ISIL, whatever you want to call it, can be solved rather quickly. You just take away their funding. Obviously, they're well-organized, well-funded, international terrorist organization and where do they get their funding from a biggie is oil they get their oil from Syria Iraq you know their territories that they claim and they pump that oil they sell it on the black market and that's how they get a lot of their money and yet people don't say you know 
don't buy oil because it helps to fund terrorists. People don't say that. And yet, when you go to the gas station and you fill up your car, you put a gallon of gas in your tank, part of those sales, maybe a, just a small fraction of a cent, but part of those sales help to fund ISIL. And you think about oil as an, an anonymous commodity. Just try filling up your car at the gas station and then when you go in to pay for it, ask the attendant where the oil came from that was used to manufacture the gasoline that you just put in your car. Odds are the cashier is just going to look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> but, I mean, if the cashier is honest, they're just going to shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know. And that's the way it is. When that oil leaves, you know, wherever, Turkey, Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, <laughs> China, where, wherever that oil comes from, you know, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Wherever that oil comes from, okay, it goes, it goes to the refineries, it's refined. Nobody really asks any questions about, okay, what was the country of origin of this oil? And it gets refined into gasoline, and then it gets, gets shipped out to your local gas station. And there's no way to tell whether that gasoline was made from Iraqi oil, or Saudi Arabian oil, or Kuwaiti oil. It's just, you know, it's, it's all gasoline to, uh, to the people selling it. And there's really no way to tell where that stuff has come from. And uh, so oil can be seen as a form, uh, a commodity, perhaps not a form of currency, but a commodity that helps to finance international terrorism, the ultimate criminal activity. It uh, has problems with causing environmental pollution, environmental damage. And you don't know where the stuff comes from. It could come from anywhere in the world. You don't know when you're buying a gallon of gasoline who you're supporting. I mean, I, I like to think I'm supporting the guy behind the, the counter that's selling me the stuff. But there are other people in the food chain that you have never met, that you don't know about, that you will never meet. And you have no idea who benefits completely from the sale of that stuff. So the criticisms that's been offered you know, concerning Bitcoin, that this is a currency that's used by criminal elements to engage in dark and nefarious activities on the web, the same thing can be said about the US dollar and oil, you know, the commodity of oil. Uh, and yet people don't say, uh, we should completely outlaw the U.S. dollar. Some people are beginning to think that way, but, I mean, it's, it's not a huge trend yet. And certainly nobody has said, we need to ban oil. No one has said that, because the petrol uh, companies are just making too much money off of it. So whether it screws up the environment or has uh, dark political consequences, they don't care as long as they're making money. That's the main thing. So, yeah, if you want to be hypocritical about it, you can say that, yeah, Bitcoin, you shouldn't use it because some criminals profit off of it. But U.S. dollars, some criminals profit off of that. Uh, fiat currencies of any nationality, some criminals profit off of that. Uh, and big oil, folks that shouldn't be profiting off of that are profiting off of that big time. So that's the dark side that I wanted to deal with. Now let's get positive like the intro music said. There is a huge positive benefit to using Bitcoin. Bitcoin really does solve some problems that I have encountered in my business activities and I bet that once I start talking about uh, these things, you will open your eyes too and realize that, yeah, I've had a lot of those same problems myself, and I didn't realize that Bitcoin could be the solution 
to some of those problems. I'll be right back. I'm going to play a song here by Barbara Leone, get into our jazz section of the music for today. And, uh, you know, feel free. Get yourself a cup of coffee and hang out with me for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. And we'll be talking about the positive side of Bitcoin. That was Barbara Leone, Don't Rain on My Parade. And uh, next we'll be getting into a little bit of music by Hunter and the Dirty Jacks and Mojo Radio. But for now, I'm going to be talking about real-world problems that can and have been solved using the Bitcoin payment system. A few years... Well, actually not. I was getting ready to say a few years ago, but it was just a couple of months ago that I ran into a problem with my credit card. I was trying to make a payment to a reputable company in Hong Kong, a company that I had done business with before using the exact same credit card. And one morning I... uh, felt like, okay, uh, I would like to do a little bit of business with these guys. So I sat down uh, on the internet, 
Had my cup of coffee going, was tapping on the keyboard, trying to make a purchase. I got all the way up to the end, clicked the, uh, clicked the right button, and saw the message come up, uh, charge declined. And I didn't know what to make of that because I had plenty of money in the account that this credit card was drawing off of. So I thought, well, maybe I just typed in the wrong number. So I sat down and tried it again. Typed in the credit card number again and pushed the little make payment now button. And again, I got the message payment declined. So I thought, okay, maybe there's an issue with that credit card for some reason. So I set it aside. I picked out another credit card tied to the exact same bank account and I thought okay I'll, I'll settle that first credit card issue later I really want to get this purchase made get this done so I sat down and plugged in all the new credit card information click the make payment button and got the same message payment declined so that's when I shook my head and I knew okay this wasn't just an issue with one credit card this was an issue with two credit cards or, you know, I don't know. I, I really didn't know where the issue was. So I called the bank. And after about 20 minutes of monkeying around on the phone, finally got a hold of, uh, of somebody. And they said, oh, yes, uh, the problem is that you live in Wheatland, Missouri, and we noticed that your card was being used by a company in Hong Kong. And it, that threw up a red flag. We thought that maybe, you know, somebody had stolen your credit card number and was doing business in Hong Kong or you'd had your credit card stolen and somebody in Hong Kong was using it without your permission. And so, yeah, we put a temporary freeze on that. And I told them, no, I was I appreciated their concern. I was very polite in, in, in the beginning of this whole conversation. And said, no, I was just trying to make a payment over the internet to this company that I had done business with before using these same credit cards. And they said, okay, yeah, we see, no problem. Uh, they went ahead and said, we'll take the hold off of your account and just go ahead and complete your business. So I thought, well, great. And I thought, you know, it's nice to know that this bank has my back when it comes to you know keeping track of where I live and where I'm spending my money at and trying to keep track too of the possibility that perhaps somebody did steal my credit card and was using it without my knowledge so I thought well great you know that took about an hour of my time to get that far with it so I thought okay I'll just go back to the computer uh, try to run this uh, little bit of business through and make my purchase I sat down use the same credit card and push the payment button and again it said payment declined and that's when I just kind of decided that I've been monkeying around with this for too long I got back on the phone with the bank I told them what had happened they apologized and said okay well we thought we'd removed that uh, that block, but you know it threw up that red flag again with our computer system, and they were blaming it on the computer system. And they said, "Okay, you can go ahead and try it again. It should work now." But uh, after about two hours of messing around, uh, actually, I think it was a little bit more than that, the total time spent, I decided I had enough with this. And I went ahead and drew money out of the bank, used it to buy the amount I needed in Bitcoin. And uh, the Bitcoin was in my wallet within 20 minutes. And then I sat down at the Internet again and tried to make the purchase this time using Bitcoin. And that wholesale went through within 30 minutes. So trying to use traditional credit cards tied to a traditional bank, you know, I was busy for most of the morning trying to make what should have been a very easy payment. 
but it was complicated. And, you know, some people will say, well, that's for your own good. That's for your own benefit. And I appreciate the fact that banks can be cautious and they do have these red flags that get raised. But, you know, when you call and you, you try to deal with it in a positive manner and that just doesn't seem to work, that the system is, I don't know, just going wonky that day, it's really nice to have an alternative payment system that you can use that goes through smoothly without a hitch and ends up costing you less money. See, the fee for Bitcoin, I don't know exactly what that is, but it's really a, a, a pretty small fee that they charge. Compare that to your you know, bank cards, credit cards, you know, what they charge, uh, PayPal, what they charge, you know, what uh, the Bitcoin wallet, the minor fee that they charge to process transactions, to send transactions through the blockchain uh, for you. It's, it's really uh, a small uh, fee compared to your credit card fees and your bank fees. And it goes through quickly. It goes through just w usually within 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour. There have been times where you try to use the Bitcoin network on a very busy day. You know, like I was doing it, what was it, uh, 4th of July. And, uh, and that took a while. It, it took about 12 hours for that payment to go through. But usually payments are lightning fast. And uh, just really have never had a problem with it. Now, some people listening may think, well, you know, that's a legitimate problem, but that's just the exception. It's not the rule, right? Uh, many times other people use their credit cards with, and, and they don't have an issue with it. And I'd have to say, well, yeah, that's, that's act probably right, because in all my years of using credit cards, I really haven't had much of an issue, maybe, you know, five or six times. Which actually, you think over the course of 30 years, that's really more than what it should be. But if you're doing business using credit cards, uh, doing business with uh, third-party organizations like PayPal that say they will accept credit cards for you, uh, you can encounter the same problem too, only in reverse. See, we live during a time which we have the World Wide Web, the world is shrinking, you know, borders, international borders are becoming, you know, more and more obscured. Even if Donald Trump does build the wall along the United States-Mexican border, uh, it's still, it's a shrinking world. The global economy is just coalescing. And people are doing business all the way around the world, sometimes without even knowing it just by sitting down at their computer and pulling out their credit cards and trying to buy something from someone or service from someone. And in, in, in our business, I mean, we do a uh, spiritual counseling service tied to our main work of uh, Temple of the Infinite Universe. And uh, we do tarot readings. And we have a, a service coming up here within the, the next few days where we are going to be teaching people how to do tarot readings for themselves. So online classes that are forming. And, uh, you know, we have clients that are all the way around the United States and some that live all around the world. We deal with folks in New York. We deal with folks in California. You know, we're in Missouri. We also deal with folks in Canada, Mexico, Puerto Rico. We've got a client in uh, India. You know, we do business all the way around the globe. And that's one thing that I love about the Internet. Something that I love to say is that, you know, we have, uh, if you're living on planet Earth, you live in our service area. And that's a pretty nice thing to be able to say. But, uh... Sometimes, using traditional credit cards, again, payments can go wonky. And uh, I'm going to turn off my phone. I forgot to turn that darn thing off. <laughs> That's a local call, not a call from India. 
But we've had issues, and uh, one of those issues have been that, yes, I want to turn that device off, has been that people trying to make credit card payments to pay for our services, they encountered the same problem that I had doing trying to do business with that company in Hong Kong. And we would get emails from customers trying to use uh, you know our internet sites and trying to pay with their credit cards via PayPal and they'd contact us and they'd say you know there's something wrong with the system my credit card payment is not going through and I'd go back and check with the problem on our end check to see if there was a problem on our end and test the system and yeah it seemed to work fine for me so I'd just say, well, I don't know what the problem is. Uh, check with your credit card company, uh, check with PayPal, and see what the issue is. And we've had some people that tried numerous times to make a payment, a payment that should have gone through using their credit card, but a payment that didn't go through. And some folks are incredibly patient. You know, they'll try, you know, two or three hours on the phone, talking to their bank, trying to get the problem resolved. And some people really aren't that patient, and they'll just say, ah, this website screwed up, blame it on <laughs> blame it on us rather than on the bank and their bank or their credit card company, and you miss the sale. So sometimes, you know, because of credit card problems, uh, payments are delayed, and sometimes you just miss the sale altogether. Now, enter Bitcoin. If you have a Bitcoin wallet address and somebody wants to pay for your service or your goods using Bitcoin, all you do, you give them your wallet address, the one that you use to receive payments, and then they can, and, and you tell them how much Bitcoin uh, they need to send to that wallet address. And then, then they go in, they go into their wallet, they plug in the information, uh, press the send button, and usually within 20 minutes, payment is received. You know, no hassles, no problems, no frozen accounts, no red flags being thrown up, uh, causing problems with the transaction. And it's just really simple. It may seem complicated to folks that have never used Bitcoin before, First time I opened up my Bitcoin wallet, took me a while to kind of figure out, you know, what was going on and what all those little numbers meant. But after you've been dealing with it for a while, you know, it just becomes second nature. So uh, uh, that's one real world problem, actually two real world problems that uh, I've had that Bitcoin has helped to solve. Now I'm going to get into a third problem here in a moment but first I'm gonna play this little song by Mojo Radio and check and see who tried to call me just now so uh, relax sip your cup of coffee and we'll be back in just a few minutes Are we rolling? Are we testing? We're rolling?
Well, it turns out that phone call was an emergency that I do need to address. A little issue of family health. So I'm going to make this next segment my last segment. And then I need to make a quick run down to the hospital. So, uh, the final problem I'm going to address here that Bitcoin does help to solve. And this is kind of a two-edged sword. But uh, the problem of chargebacks, like uh, if you're in business and you're receiving payments via PayPal or, you know, some other service, uh, a lot of times PayPal will have uh, policies that favor the buyer over the seller. And if you're buying things using that service, that's a great deal. You know, if you're doing business with somebody that is shady and you think that you've been taken, you can complain to, you know, PayPal or some of these other payment uh, servers, processors, and they will uh, intercede and sometimes act on your behalf, whether, you know, you're really in the right or not. Now, in business, you know, there's a saying, the customer is always right. But, you know, sometimes folks in business take a licking when they really shouldn't. But, uh, you know, that's one positive side to uh, PayPal. Now, a negative side is that if somebody buys something and uh, they don't like your service, uh, but it's no fault of your own. <laughs> I mean, you try your best to, to help the person and uh, they take, you know, whatever it is that you give them and they just decide that they don't want to pay for it, well, sometimes they can complain and they can have a charge back and, uh, you know, you're just out. You're just out uh, if you're shipping products out to them and they have an issue or they create an issue simply because they don't want to pay for the product, then they can raise a red flag and uh, if PayPal happens to agree with them, then you're out the money. And, you know, the buyer, you know, sometimes they have the option of sending the item back or sometimes if they're unscrupulous, they don't even do that. And we've been stung a little bit uh, through that. You know, I've taken losses that I really felt I shouldn't have taken. And with Bitcoin now, you don't have 
a third party interceding between you and your customer telling you how to run your business. You get to make the business decisions. And that's kind of a positive thing. And it can also be seen as sort of a negative thing. Because, uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, somebody does business with you and they, they honestly feel that they did not get the quality that they expected, the service that they expected, or the product that they expected, then what they can do is, uh, using a third-party server, uh, they can request a refund. Now, doing Bitcoin transactions, there are no chargebacks. There's no middleman that you can talk to that uh, can intercede on your behalf. So that's a good thing for the merchant, the person doing the sales. It can be kind of a bad thing for the, uh, the person making the payments and uh, purchasing either the goods or the services because they don't have any guarantee that uh, there's somebody that they can go to with their problem and get their problem addressed if the merchant isn't willing to address the problem his or herself. Now, uh, this raises a problem, a problem that a lot of people don't even think of, but the problem of being careful who you do business with. A lot of times when you're buying something online, over the internet, buying things is just so easy so quick and easy that you don't stop to think you know who is this person who am I dealing with do I know them do they uh, have a reputable organization are they honest and when we're doing business over the internet we strive to be honest we do go with that philosophy that the customer is always right and sometimes you know like when doing a tarot reading you know, that's something that's it's a service that's very personal, one-on-one. -on -one. And we've had problems, you know, where people would say, you know, that was a bad reading. You'll give them advice, you'll, you'll tell them what you see honestly, what you feel honestly, and you'll give them advice that comes straight from your heart. And a lot of times, some, not, not a lot of times, but sometimes, these are the minority. Sometimes people will look at you and say, you don't know what you're talking about. You've picked up on the wrong energy. This was a bad reading. And then sometimes they'll say, I want my money back. And usually what we'll do is, yeah, we'll just give them their money back, give them a refund. Because we want our customers to be happy. The customer is always right. And sometimes what happens is that after the customer, the client, has had some time to process what has been said and to think about the advice that we have given, they will look at their own hearts, they will look with eyes wide open at their own situation, and they will think, you know what, I didn't want to admit it before, but that reading was right. That reading was correct. And <laughs> this is what I love, is when you give somebody their money back and then they have a chance to think about it and reconsider it, and then of their own free will, they just send you the refund right back and they say, you know what, you're right. I'm sorry, I apologize. And uh, they go ahead and give you back the money that you just returned and they go on to be really some of your best clients love it when that happens but sometimes for people that are dealing with folks that they don't know that well and that they don't really trust sometimes uh, sending payments without having a third party to intercede for them can seem kind of dangerous and if you like the protections, you know, that PayPal offers you in that regard or your credit card company, 
then by all means, you know, go ahead, keep using it. But when you're dealing with folks that you know, that you trust, that you would gladly pay uh, in cash if you were doing business face-to-face -face rather than over the Internet, then for those businesses, yeah, go ahead and use Bitcoin because, uh, yeah, you shouldn't have much of a problem with it if you know them and if you trust them and if these are people that you would gladly pay using cash then yeah there's no problem with using Bitcoin but just remember you know for the merchant this is great because there are no automatic chargebacks you know the credit card company can't say okay we've decided that you were wrong and this other person was right so we're gonna take we're gonna freeze your funds or uh, force you to refund money you don't have other people telling you how to run your business with Bitcoin you are in control you just have to make sure that you uh, that you keep track of your wallet address that to receive funds you give people your public address not your private keys but your public keys you keep your private keys private and uh, just send your public keys to people that you are doing business with and just keep track of your uh, access codes, your uh, seed phrase, your uh, passcodes, and you shouldn't have any problems with it. It takes a little bit of time to get used to it, but uh, with experience, I think you'll, uh, you'll find that Bitcoin actually does solve a few real-world problems. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't solve the problem of family health, so I'm going to have to wrap this broadcast up and rush over to the nursing home seems my mother is not doing too well today so I'm gonna leave you with a song here by Prometheus excuse me by Hunter and the Dirty Jacks called Prometheus and until we meet again across the internet I wish you a blessed day of spiritual discovery and have fun uh, exploring the world of Bitcoin if you're not into it already and just give it a fair shake and I think you will be very happy with it so Hunter and the Dirty Jacks Prometheus and we will see you again later thanks for tuning in Forbidden to go Life in the hills I was this lady of flame The moment I saw her It was clear why I came This is a daughter of Zeus Here yeah, those are clearly the arms Now I got something in mind I gotta steal from the gods She moves with the